This video is sponsored by Stream. Build high quality, flexible chat experiences in your iOS app with the Stream SDK. Get started for free with the link in the description down below. What's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. In today's video, we're gonna be learning about the subscript syntax and feature in the Swift programming language. It's basically how you can get or set a value using square brackets, very similar to passing an index to an array or the key to a dictionary. So if that sounds good, drop a like down below, hit subscribe if you're new to the channel and let's open up Xcode and dig into some subscripts. All right, we're gonna get started by opening up Xcode and we're gonna work in a playground today. So we're gonna go to File, New, and Create a Playground. We're gonna stick with a blank playground. Tongue Twister is there, and we're gonna go ahead and call this subscripts.playground. Go ahead and save it wherever you'd like. I'm gonna to toss it onto my desktop. And first things first, as soon as Xcode decides to stop being slow, we're gonna go ahead and expand this window. I'm gonna bump up that font size as well so we can all see it. So what the heck is a subscript? And I know I'm gonna uh, bounce on that word a few times in this video or trip over it, I should say, since it's a tongue twister. So let's say I have an array and this array is an array of numbers. So let's say one, two, three, four, super crazy array. And let's say I say print out array, and then we're gonna use these brackets. I'm gonna say print out the thing at index number one. So we should get the second value in this array. If I go ahead and hit the play button, we should see the number two gets printed out, which is not a surprise, but what I am trying to uh, get at here is the square bracket is actually doing something under the hood. It's actually going into the array and it's looking at the second position. How do we take that functionality, rip it out and put it into our own type of object? And that's where we introduce the topic of subscripts. So I'm gonna do one more example with a dictionary. Let's say we have a word and it has a value. So let's say word and thing, let's say thing is two. And once again, we can print out from the dictionary, go ahead and print out, we're gonna say apple, and we expect that to not print out anything, it's nil, since apple's not in the uh, dictionary, and we can print out word. And we print out the value for word, we'll print out the integer that it's correlated to being one. So this example is a little more involved since it also supports nullability. So let's do our own example and see this in action. So let's say we create an object, and it's gonna be a struct, it could be a class as well, and I'm gonna call it times table. This object is basically gonna allow us to compute the quotient when we multiply various numbers. We're gonna say a multiplier that we're gonna pass in here is going to be an integer, and this is how we can create a times table. So let's say I instantiate it, let's say I say the seven times table will be times table, and the multiplier we're gonna pass in here is going to be seven. Now it would be kind of cool if I can simply print out the uh, quotient of, let's say doing you know, the seven times table, multiply it by one, two, three, et cetera, so on and so forth. Now I can't do this because the struct is not a dictionary or an array and there's no way to pass in the number with the square brackets, hence these errors that we're getting over here. So how do we actually support this? Uh, we're gonna bring in subscript and we're gonna go ahead and put parens here and we're gonna say we can pass in an integer and it's gonna return to us something. It's gonna return basically the index, or I should actually call this number is what I'll call it. So we'll see if it accepts that. We'll say number times the multiplier, which is the instance property right up above. And that's basically how we'll get that to return. So I believe it also wants us to put an index here instead of the word number for the argument given how it uh, wants it to behave. So if you replace number with index, it'll make it happy or it should make it happy. And if it's not, let's see what's going on. Ah, we need also a return value so I can undo that number. And this subscript obviously returns the multiplied uh, quotient. So we're gonna do return number times multiplier. And down here, if we go ahead and clear all of this out, and if we run this again, you'll start to see we'll get 714 and 21. So it's insanely simple to use subscript to extend any object with this functionality with these square brackets and it actually gets pretty powerful if you start scaling up this model. So let's say we do another example. Let's say we have a 
a grid of elements. So let's say we have a grid, and in here we have you know columns, which is going to be I don't know. Let's say a column uh, of one. So let's say we have a grid actually inside of here directly. It's going to be a two-dimensional array. I'm going to make up this example. I'm going to play it by ear. So we're going to say pass in uh, rows here. So we'll say one, one, one. I'm just going to copy and paste this for a total of four uh, rows here. We're going to change all of these to be two. And we basically have a modeled grid now in a data structure. Now a subscript up above, we're just passing in one element and returning the multiplied quotient. Now you can actually pass in multiple things into a subscript function. So in theory, you can say pass in a row as well as a column, and we're gonna return uh, int optional, which will basically be the item at those coordinates for the row and column, and if we can't find it, we're gonna return nil. So now what I'm gonna say is from the grid, First and foremost, each of these represents a row. So the first thing we want to figure out is the column. Pass in the column and then pass in the row to that and return it. So we're going to say let number equals this guy and return it. Now this is not particularly safe. And the reason I say it's not safe is what happens, um, and the error is actually getting at what I'm going to explain, what happens if we pass in a huge number for column? What you're going to start to see is uh, your program crashing and the reason is is because it'll be out of bounds we only have four rows uh, and four columns so this first number has to be uh, less than three since arrays are enumerated from zero upwards the point being here you got to be kind of careful when you start to get into these out of range and out of bound issues so it also cannot find grid that's because up here we spelt grid wrong so that's what I wanted to fix as well. And this, we can actually probably get rid of that optionality. But what I'm going to go ahead and do is we can say max columns is going to be grid.count. And we can say it's grid.count minus one because, again, things are enumerated from zero. And we're going to say guard call is less than, uh, less than max columns. And we can say comma call is greater than or equal to zero. So no negative numbers either. If that is not the case, we're just going to return nil. So we don't want to go and crash down here. We're just going to return nil right off the bat. We're going to say we don't need to proceed. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing for rows. So here I can say the column, or I can say call numbers is going to be from the grid, get the column. Now once we have the column, we should actually call this the row. Now we're going to check that the target row, and I can call this row numbers, that the row numbers is, or rather the row is greater than or equal to zero, and that the row is less than row numbers minus one. And hopefully my math is correct on that, otherwise we're going to see some funky crashing. And if those are not case, we're just going to be doing a nil return, just like that, very similar to what we did up above for columns. And then finally we can just return column and row. So now that we've got this set up, we can go ahead and use it. So it looks like we have an error here. So let's see what's going on. So this should be row numbers dot count since it is an array. So now what I can do is down here in the grid, I can just instantiate it. So I can say my grid equals a grid. And let's make sure we can do that. It doesn't complain. All right. Then the next thing we want to do is say my grid, go ahead and get the element at row and column positions. So here, let's go ahead and say one and one. It might want the argument labels. I don't actually remember off the top of my head, so we're gonna figure it out. It looks like it does not want it. So let's go ahead and print this out. So get the thing at index one for the row and index one for the column. So we expect to get, I believe, two. So let's go ahead and give this a run and let's see what we end up getting. So I'm gonna clear out my console. We're also going to go ahead and give this a run. So we're getting a uh, warning here because we should probably interpolate it in a string. So I'm going to say grid value. We're going to paste that in our parens and we're going to go ahead and give this guy a run by hitting pause and hitting run one more time. And we should see the value printed out at the bottom there. So the grid value is optional too. So it is definitely going to be optional because my grid, right, it can return, like this subscript can return optional. 
it actually says it right here. We can say we're returning int optional. So what we want to go ahead and do is coalesce this to a default value. We'll say no value found. And I can go ahead and copy and paste this. So let's say I pass in a enormous number for our column. Obviously, it'll crash if we didn't put in the guards, but since we have put in the guards, since we should not be crashing, let's see what the issue here is. We need to coalesce it. We're going to say negative one. We need to coalesce it to an integer, which is why it's complaining. We're going to coalesce it as a default value of negative one if we're not able to find a value. So we expect to see negative one for the bottom uh, call of this because there is not a column 12, which would be index 13. So hopefully those two examples showcase the power of subscript functions on any object. You can go ahead and pass in as many arguments as you want. It's just a fancy function and you can do a lot of computation with it under the hood. Now, the examples I've shown here are getters. So in other words, they return something always. Now, what you could also do is apply a setter. So you can go ahead and say get, we can do this. And let's say we have a set. What we could do is you can take in a value and you can say in the grid at the column and then the row assign the value. Now this is a little more uh, involved to do examples, hence I didn't do it. The getter approach is by far the most common, but I at least wanted to call it out that it is available to you should you choose to use it. So that is all I've got for you guys today. Pretty short and sweet video showing subscripts in Swift. It's pretty commonly used at lower levels, but not often talked about. So if you learned something new, if you enjoyed the video, drop a like down below, hit subscribe. If you're into iOS and want to stick around and don't hesitate to leave a comment. If you've got any questions, always more than happy to answer them. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you guys in the next one.